Hey guys, welcome to the Working Class Bow Hunter Podcast. Uh, me and Austin here on the intro, and actually the whole episode. What's, what's up, up dude? Well, I wanted to say what's up first. Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? Hey, giant buck on the table, huh? I got a couple of them in there, not too shabby. We have a actually one, three. Well, we'll go one sixty-seven, a one sixty-five, and a one ninety around the studio table as we speak. That's a lot of bone. Magical is what it is. Magical. <laughs> I love it, man. You're a big boy's euro it out. Um, man, we've been busy. Um, first of all, a huge thank you to everyone for supporting us. Um, we kind of thank you guys the last few episodes, but uh, we're just thankful. So thank you for being on Patreon. More uh, Steve series podcast. And if you don't know what that is, I'll play the uh, I'll hit the button and play the ad so you kind of know what we're talking about. But Steve has a series on Patreon. If you're a top tier subscriber, you can listen to that. But uh, no, want to wish you a Merry Christmas. That's, uh, man, this week. It's crazy. Dude, it snuck up on us again. I haven't bought anybody any presents. Yeah, I'm slacking. Good thing I've got a, a nice wife that does all that. It's good, man. Keep her around. <laughs> uh, man, Christmas came up quick. Uh, we're going to be busy. Trade shows are coming up. Uh, we don't need to list them all here now. We're, we're going to get right to business. The podcast is brought to you by Elite Archery. Um, man, the elites have just been tearing it up this year for us. I'm super thankful for that partnership. Code WCB Elite Archery dot com. Um, Loophold Optics, Camo Fire, Novix, Tree Stands, Old Barn Taxidermy, Scent Crusher, Rogue Ridge, Spy Point Trail Cameras, Big Time. Um, just, I don't know. I don't know how to like thank our partners enough that we've like looked up to these brands growing up and we actually use these products and to get them to back us is awesome. Yeah, products that all help put antlers on the table like what we're looking at right now. I mean, it's pretty crazy. And they're all like cat. We've kind of, we're lucky in that it's been set up to category, right? Like um, HHA Sports has been a par- partner for a long time. Victory Arrows, Huntworth Camo, uh, new code for Huntworth WCB15, uh, Sleek Trick Broadheads, Pull Back and Let Go, Combination Creative, Isotunes. Um, you know, we, we go into a lot of detail on our ads on a lot of episodes and you know, we don't ever want to burn you guys out, but these are companies like we actually work with and we're proud to work with and we're proud of. So it's easy for us to talk about it. And I listen to a, a lot of uh, non hunting industry podcasts that do ads. And I listen to them because one, I think it helps me expand on how we do our ads, but, but I appreciate it because I think the guys I listen to, if those brands support them, then I'm more likely to look into those brands. Um, so we apologize if you guys ever get burnt out on our ads, but it's uh, really coming from a genuine point of view. Um, if a company approaches, well, that's why we don't do anything with like estrus or urine or anything like that. It's not, I'm not saying we never would, like in, unless I became like a believer of something, but we've turned down a lot of money and a lot of products and a lot of like potential future deals and stuff because it's just something we don't use. It's yep. just, we're being honest about it. Um, but man, I, I just... I don't know how I can thank the people behind these brands enough that we are friends with everyone from these brands and and we are thankful for including us and what they do and trusting us to represent their product. Um, And we're going to try and do some podcasts with each company and I'll reach out to you guys uh, even on Patreon. Like, Hey, what's the hard questions you want to ask some of these partners of if something you have, you have a problem with something or want to know something like that. I'm sure they'd be more than happy to answer it on the platform, but Huge shout out to them. Um, HHA USA supports our veteran shout out. Um, Doug normally reads the veteran shout outs. Uh, Chris Ham, one of the owners of HHA Sports, a, sp- a p- partner of ours for a long time. Um, passionate about helping veterans, helping them get back into the outdoors, um, helping them get back and finding archery, something that can basically get them into a community. Um, you know, not everybody needs it, but the guys that do, you know, it helps a lot. You know, archery is an awesome thing to be a part of. And, the hunting community in general is just a good place, just full of really good camaraderie from, I think every angle. Oh, for sure. If you want to know the truth, but um, yeah, I don't know, man. I I don't know. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but it's just cool to be a part of the industry in the way that we have been. And uh, we're thankful for you guys uh, supporting us. Um, Much appreciated. Yeah, it is. It's a dream come true. I guess I should I make an announcement. I wasn't, I didn't plan on making an announcement, but I think I could because this lines up. Do it. I'm scared. <laughs> should I? I guess I should because I'm debating it on the podcast. I am leaving my day job like within a day of this airing to do the podcast. Let me shake time. your hand. That's a big moment for you. 
Thanks, buddy. Congratulations, my man. Thank you, man. I'm uh, I'm scared shitless, to be 100% honest with you, but uh, I'm chasing a dream. And to be honest with you guys, um, my dad passing away kind of made me realize a lot of things about life. And uh, I feel at my day job, I've always been super distracted at my day job because I want to chase a passion, which is hunting. And then second came the podcast and that became, well, maybe there's an opportunity for me to hustle at this. And uh, my goal is to just kill it, really. Hey, it's been six years in the making and here we are today. So yeah, good on you, buddy. Thanks, brother. And I want to bring my crew with me, you know, and I want out and, you know, that being said, that's going to open up. I'm hoping more time, you know, uh, working class on DeerCast is going to be a weekly series. The CC Hunt Files is going to be a weekly series. We're going to be doing more video podcasts. We're going to be doing more exclusive stuff on Patreon. We're going to try and do, I mean, there's a ton of stuff we have on, on the roster for 22. We have uh, just different video series that we're planning on uh, bringing to YouTube. I mean, you name it. We're going to attack this thing from every angle. And we just appreciate you supporting us. So that, that's my big announcement. I was kind of nervous to announce it. I don't know why. I think it's just because it makes it real. It's a big deal. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, it's crazy. Uh, it's nuts, man. I wish my dad was around to see it because, you know what I mean? He'd, he, he'd definitely be like, do it, man. I do too, buddy. You know, because th- my biggest fear was being reti- like about to retire or being in bad health when I'm older or something crazy happening like what happened to my old man. Being like, I wish I would have fucking tried it. Yep. You know, because you can't ever take it back. Well, you got to have stones to do what you're doing and actually right. jump in and try it. So kudos, man. Thanks, brother. Well, I appreciate you being a part of it. Yep. It's, it's been, been awesome. It's been a big help. And uh, my hope is that in uh, a couple of years, we got everybody at this office working full time, hustling whatever we're hustling. We're keep doing what we're doing. So thank you guys for supporting the fuck out of us. We appreciate it. And uh, hope you enjoy this podcast. This was a fun one, a little different. Uh, in a good way, different. More of a think about some shit different, right? Yeah, it'll get you thinking. So, cool. Hope you enjoy it, and uh, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm Chase Rolson with Rubline Marketing. This is Jeff Lindsay. This is Michael Pitt. Hey, everybody. It's John Dudley from Knock On TV. Hey, guys. This is Jared Scheffler from Whitetail Adrenaline. <laughs> Hi, I'm Taylor Drury from Drury Outdoors. Hey, this is Nick Munt from Ball Collector. Hey, this is Melissa Buckman. Working class bow hunter. Working class bow hunter. Working class bow hunter podcast. Working class bow hunter podcast. Working class bow hunter. Working class bow hunter. Working class bow hunter. You're listening to the working class bow hunter. That's right. This is the podcast for Billy Joe Lunch Bucket, the working man, just like me and you. My name's Travis T Bone Turner from the Bone Collector. Thank you for tuning in. Nobody pushes the envelope like working class bow hunter. It's really, really not that good. Working class bow hunter. Welcome to the Working Class Bow Hunter Podcast. Aaron Snyder is uh, I would say in the house, but he's calling in, so it's the next best thing for uh where we live to get together to do a podcast. What's up, man? Not not too much. Uh, just dealing with uh, dealing with the winter weather. Yeah, I think you're probably getting a little bit of the worst end of it than us. It was almost seventy degrees today. Yeah, it was pretty nice. <laughs> a little uh, uh, out of box for us. Yeah, it snowed here. So yeah, but I live um, up for, I'm a oh just right at ten thousand, just under ten thousand feet. So it's it's pretty uh, pretty rough from here on out until. Uh, we probably had five feet of snow in March, so yeah, it's pretty crazy here. No kidding. Do you get sick of that? Do you get sick of the winter weather? Or do you, I mean, do you do much hunting in it? Or I mean, what's your kind of like thought process on it? Well, I guide January, February, March in Texas, so <laughs> no, I do not like the winter weather. Um, I mean, I don't mind a, a little bit of cold and snow, but it's a bit much here. Like, I probably should go pull my 3D targets down. But <clears throat> I've got a life uh, life size elk. And uh, you could see the head of it um, <laughs> in the in the in the worst month. So I probably should have pulled them a little early last year too. Yeah, it, see, it, you know, being in the Midwest, like right now, if you're whitetail hunting, of course, like we want the the brutally cold weather because it just forces the deer to eat. And uh, other than that, it's hard to make a game plan on a big buck late season. You're just kind of waiting on a like a really hard cold front, you know. And more snow, the better because it forces them to the food. 
<clears throat> yeah, I mean, and you know, the saying of one man's shit is another man's gold. One man's really cold weather is uh, another man's not so bad. So like Texas, you know, 40 is pretty cold for the deer. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I'm going back down with my wife Christmas Eve. Uh, I'll be on doe patrol. Uh, she'll have some buck tags, but uh, we'll hunt Texas and Oklahoma. But um, well, I'm sure I'll get blasted for this Texas. The first thing I do is pile about 200 pounds of corn under every feeder because they're recovering from the rut. Right. And uh, you know, the, the big bucks still don't come to feeders, but on Doe Patrol, it's great. Um, and there's no, you know, where I'm at, it's it's way up north. So it's not like a high fence. Yeah, you know, they're pretty, just like hunting Oklahoma or, um, yeah, I mean, southern Kansas or whatever. For it's sure. kind of the, like right there, triangle. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it there, um, it, it was kind of weird. It generally, it will get really cold in the panhandle. Uh, when I shot my owl dad, the next day was uh, six degrees with 40 mile an hour winds Ooh. and blowing snow. But it's, <laughs> again, it's not really Texas in the sense of weather because it's so far north. It, it gets pretty rough. Right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. But I mean, yeah, I mean, it's still cold, still going to get those deer moving. That's I've never hunted Texas and I've always wanted to. And we have some loose plans to kind of go down there this spring and like, I know there's like different opinions on it, and I think this is where we'll end up talking about some of the controversial, opinionated stuff here within this episode. But I, I think like a Texas exotic hunt would be a riot, and I feel and I feel like there's a lot of people that probably like judge on it and might think it's not that cool, which I kind of get. But I, I think I would really enjoy it. It'd be a fun trip with your buddies. I think. I think so. I think what people have to understand with Texas is it is so big. Uh, and, and you know what? I, I guide a lot down there and you guide in the Davis mountains and you're at five to 7,000 feet. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen some of the terrain, but you're in cliffs and mountains and not what you would expect when you drive down to the Davis through the Guadalupe mountains, you feel like you're in another world. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's insane. And then you go to the hill country. It's the standard typical, what people think of Texas, you know, I mean, it's, uh, when I say that, meaning there's high fence places and everything, and you go up towards the panhandle, um, you're in basically Oklahoma, southern Kansas, that kind of a thing. And so I, I think since it's such a big state, well, I see guys that get their ass eaten alive when I'm guiding them that expect it to be, I mean, the gun comes out quick, you know, I'm going to bow hunt. <laughs> and Okay, well, you know, I, I, when I was with Barclow and, and Pachuto from Sickbo Chronicles, Barclow with Sitka, with Barclow and I, we were doing 12 miles a day. Uh -huh. People don't think of Texas that way. And again, up in the panhandle, I've hunted all just about every state you can hunt for whitetail, within reason, of course. And it's no different. I mean, you got to figure out bed to feed. Um, you, you know, in the sense of it's not like, oh, here's a feeder. I'm going to shoot a 160 buck. 160 bucks don't come to feeder. Well, they do at night. But you're still using feed. I mean, you got to... This has been a huge debate. If corn is legal, you better be using corn mm -hmm. or you're not going to shoot shit. I mean, that's just how life works. And Oklahoma is the same way. But to shoot the big bucks I've shot down there, which aren't giant, but good bucks, I'm generally one to 300 yards off a of feeder, either between bed to feeder or, you know, uh, ag field to feed or to bed. I mean, you got to be strategic with it. Mm -hmm. And I've hunted Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, um, you know, Wisconsin. You're doing the same thing. There's just a feeder somewhere involved. In it. And it gets bashed a lot. And I've gotten, I don't really give a shit anymore. It is what it is. But <laughs> I, I challenge like, come on down, boys. Let me see what you got. You right, know, right. Like, I've hunted all the states and it's this, I've shot bucks in every one. And you still got to, you got to still, the, the feeder helps them taking away that but you, you still have to have a brain you still have to watch the wind you still have to know where they're betting you have to know where the feed is and right. obviously the feeder will help but it also can kick you right in the nuts because they're like oh i'm going to a feeder there's probably a fat white dude in the tree so that's kind of a problem <laughs> fat white dude <laughs> yeah i mean well that's exactly it i've always heard that you know feeders make animals nocturnal which makes sense but yeah i feel as i grow as a hunter and i'm for sure guilty of this like especially on a podcast i'm guilty of probably judging something that I don't have experience with and then probably got experience with and then realized I was an idiot for judging it. And I feel like that's just like the problem with a lot of it. Like, uh, like, like you kind of just, 
you know, alluded to a feeder almost is like in the bag first day, 160 buck down and I'm going to drink beer and camp for the rest of the time. You know, and like you said, it's not the case. And it's for does. I mean, you're going to shoot a doe. Right. Right. Yeah. So, and I'm in the same boat as you. I came from Oregon and only hunted out West and, and baiting. You might as well be sleeping with your sister. It's a gimme. <laughs> right. Well, I was, yeah, let, he threw me in a tree stand in, in Alabama. Well, those deer don't, I'm like, the deer where I was hunting when I was in Minnesota didn't look up. These little deer come in looking up, right? Like, <laughs> right. You may see them, but you're not going to get a shot. And I took a shot at a deer in Alabama at 47 yards on film. Didn't know we were there. Now, we were hunting you know, bed to feed to feeder, you know, the, the triangle, right. That there was seven feet on camera when my arrow got to it shooting 287 feet per second. Damn. <laughs> so I did not take any more far shots. I, I was like, Oh, right. uh, that's not going to pan out for me. <laughs> like, right. I could, I, I could have shot, uh, you know, literally could have shot a possum that I didn't know was there. I was like, Holy <laughs> shit, that deer got out of the way quick. So it, it's been an eye opener for me. And, and much <laughs> like you, I have eaten a lot of crow over time where, uh, you know, I'm like, oh yeah, whatever. That's going to be easy. And then I've got down there and seven arrows deep in the dirt. <laughs> well, I guess I better start aiming low. These things seem to be a little cracked out. I mean, it's right. Just, right. Learn as you go. Right. That's what's fun about hunting, man. And just like our community in general, like there's so much to learn all the time. And you think, you know, something in one spot. Well, it's like, once you know, whitetails, like you can, hunt, you, you think and think, you know, whitetails in Illinois, then go to Texas, like you're saying, and then all of a sudden you don't know whitetails. You got to relearn. You might know them, but you don't know the terrain. Yeah, those that guys that have use. general knowledge are going to do okay, but you just like the fine points that we're talking about here, just things that you have to learn hunting that specific area. 100%. Yeah. And, and Aaron, I know um, we got some, I don't know how I want to get into this. So I want to talk a little bit with you without, it's kind of getting old and I'm sure you're probably sick of talking about it. And, and I'm sorry for the hard transition, but I'm, I'm just moving along the whole influencer thing lately that's kind of been fired up in the podcast article circle. And I think we all know what I'm talking about. Like the Matt Ranella thing, the Steve Ranella thing. And then recently we became the poster child for that with posting uh, the coyote eaten Chandler <laughs> buck. And uh, you and I talked the other night on the phone, Aaron, I heard you guys kind of, you definitely weren't bashing us by any means, but you guys brought it up in one of your roundtable podcasts about the photo that got posted. And uh, so I, I want to talk about kind of like what's going on with the hunting online community. Is that a fair way to put it? Or do you think it's an industry I, I standpoint? I know. I would say the online community because a lot of people that aren't online don't give a shit. And they're oblivious, which probably is they sleep better than we do. Um, but yeah, I would say it's an online thing. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, and, and I'll be honest, I don't consume any, ri- really any at all outdoor content. I don't know how much you consume, Aaron. Do you listen to other podcasts and stuff like that? Mm, only when I hear I'm in them and then I'm kind of forced to, but no, I don't, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I kind of, um, I let, you know, uh, now don't get me wrong, if there's something I can learn from, like if somebody is doing, uh, uh, i trying to think what a good example would be. Oh, we're yeah, losing I you. To put the tree hopper on a couple times, right? The tree saddle. The tree saddle. Okay, we got you back. You what, cut out for a minute, that? but we got you back. Yeah. And we're losing you again. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the tree diaper. The tree diaper. We're we're kind of you're kind of cutting so, out, man. Uh, hold on. Let's see if this gets any better. It's better now. <clears throat> okay, so I. I have uh, been through mountaineering schools. I understand knots and, you know, like I get the concept of hanging from a rope with a diaper around you, mm-hmm. but I am not an expert at that. So I've listened to a few podcasts touching on that, but I don't, I would have to say out of all of your podcasts, I've probably listened to 20 minutes of them, just snippets, yeah. uh, thing, you know, things like that. Nothing against, we promote you guys. Yeah. yeah. I just, I mean, I do my own thing and I hunt my own way and I don't, you know, if you have like an interesting guest, yep. You know, if somebody shoots me a, a, a snippet, like, dude, check this one out. This is awesome. Mm-hmm. I'll listen. But quite honestly, I, I don't have, I don't have time. I, I, I for sure. I, I run a, a company. I hunt way too much. I guide. I do 97,000 podcasts a month. I answer 4 million <laughs> questions. Yep. Not a lot of time for podcasts. It's just right. how it is. Well, yeah. And I get that. I don't think 
it, really a whole lot of our crew listens to other one because we don't want it to like subconsciously influence what we do or or how we talk if that makes sense you know when you hang around someone and you start picking up on things they say and you just start saying them that type of effect no different than no different than designing a pack yeah you don't want to go you know you want to know you're not copying somebody but you don't want to copy by default because you looked at it either so yeah yeah that's a good point you know like i guess yeah i never thought of it that way but yeah you know if if we do something or say something somebody else does it's more than likely 100 percent coincidence which you know i guess maybe we should pay more attention but we don't but that being said you know um and, and it's funny like if someone sends you a snippet we had someone send a snippet of of, of kafaru cast uh w- which is you know from from what i have listened other than that you know it is awesome you guys do a great job and the quality is fucking awesome um but i heard that our photo that we posted on instagram the other day got brought up and we chatted about it on the phone the other day so i kind of wanted to bring that up because it just happened at it happened at a it was bad timing on our part from when the Matt Ranella article got put out and then removed like days before. <laughs> yeah, you were talking about luck. If it was uh, if they were giving away pussy, you guys would have been in jail. You could have not <laughs> that at a worse time. <laughs> it, it, it was and you know, we we did a podcast and walked through it, you know, episode four eighty six if people haven't heard it. And I know you haven't listened to it, but uh, we put that out like the next day so people could understand the story because there was some people that had a problem with the the quality of the photo, as in there was a deer with its ribs eaten and Chandler had a smile. I think that was a big problem with a lot of one. people. Yep. But then there was the other half of people that hated were pissed at Chandler because he let it go overnight. Thought that it was a wounded deer or a bad shot, you know. Yeah. The Turns out it wasn't. Pe- people that didn't know the story. Right. So there was people who read it and then made up their own. This is what I want to believe about this. Fuck you guys. And then there was uh, people who, and I get it. We're not acting like we don't understand their angle of like, hey, dude, that's fuel to the fire against us because it looks bad. Um, Our perspective is we wanted to be transparent about the situation and not post a photo with just a skull cap. Because then we knew if we did that. I've never posted a picture and tried to have been careful about the condition of the deer. Like I've always tried to tell the truth about the hunt and the way it happened and the end result. So for me, it was just a a new experience. And we talked about this before. Now that we've got a little bit of a limelight on us, we kind of have to be a little more careful. You know, we're Mm -hmm. ambassadors for for our brand and for the hunting community in general. So we just have to kind of mind our P's and Q's a little bit more. I, I Yeah, I mean, I think like, in the way I look at it, and I've had to do it, um, I have uh, been in situations where I want to tell the story, but you don't want to tell the story in a bad light, but you don't want to lie or be disingenuous. Mm-hmm. And you're like, well, let's think about this. Okay, do we post this, uh, uh, a photo like or, or a 15-second video saying, biggest fuck of my life and this happened, guys? If I can tell you any info and give your spiel, you know, this is what happened. This is what we did wrong. This is what we did. And now all of that, I agree with, like, you kind of are almost morally obligated to, I mean, I personally don't shit gold unless maybe you guys do. I, I have had shit happen in the field and it, it happened. Yeah. That's and just, that's just bow sure, hunting. Yeah. That's I mean, believe me, I've, I've been on everything from, you know, it just get me within 700 yards from me and old Betsy and we're putting her down. And the next thing you know, I'm running down a cliff praying to God, I can keep up with this wounded animal. Yep. It's rifle bow. It doesn't matter. Recurve compound. And again, you don't want to be disingenuous, but how do you s- spread the word of what happened? Put the knowledge out there of, of what happened, right, wrong, how to change it and how you felt at the time you were excited. You found the buck but you were also heartbroken that you found it the way you did. Yep. I don't think you guys did anything wrong on any of that shit. Mm-hmm. Just when you smiled behind it. Now, and keep in mind, like we talked about the other day, I look at this from a much different lens because I am in Denver, Colorado. Mm-hmm. And you cannot throw a hippie in Denver without a landing on a Subaru. <laughs> They're everywhere. <laughs> so right. you, you, you look at it from a different lens because I do photo shoots with anti and, and you know neutral people, whatever you want to call it mountaineering stores right hikers you run into and they would not use that photo in the light you wanted it to be shed in mm-hmm. they would grab that photo cut out all the context look at this bloodthirsty animal happy that he killed it and he didn't get the meat from it 
not what you wanted to portray, but how they wanted it. And that was my thing of like, okay, from my lens and where I'm at, that's why. Because yep. if they had the photo with just the deer, well, it's pretty hard to make up anything from that. I mean, it doesn't give them as much ammo. And, and that's the light I was looking at. Yep. And, the way I was looking at it. and we're, I'm, I'm small time. Like I'm a farm boy from a small town, you know, I'm, I, I can't say I'm used to walking up on deer that, that the coyotes have got to, but death is just a part of life on the farm. So when I posted that picture, it was not posted to ignite any kind of social media fire or anything like that. And when it did happen, it was, it was a surprise. You know, I knew that the picture was graphic, but I didn't think it was going to get the response well, that it got. Let's rewind that because, uh, I've, I hang around a lot of cattle ranchers. Um, and if you're, uh, you guys, I mean, obviously you're in the central, right? The heart of it. Yeah. Oh yeah. We're, it is, it is, it is. Uh, I'm going to try not to cuss too much. It irritates the living shit out of me that when something happens like what happens to you guys from an anti-hunter perspective, it is horrible. It's ammo, whatever. But let's say it's from an anti-hunter that's not a vegan or a vegetarian. Mm -hmm. They, they eat beef. Mm-hmm. As you guys know, they don't all make it, right? You drive up, bunch of crows, whatever, there's, you know, cows die, weather, you know, whatever. And it's like, okay, they died the same death as a wounded animal, probably much worse because a wounded animal is going to die faster than something that dies from weather yep. or whatever. So yep. it's like, do we abolish the cattle industry? Oh, yeah, that's real bright. Um, you know, and, and that's the thing that, that, that I get irritated at is, this still happens if you're eating cheeseburger at McDonald's. You just don't see it. You're 100%. a, you're a, you know, you're killing it with your paycheck. You're a whatever the grocery store assassin. But <laughs> right, when you do right. it the right way, and and then you explain when something goes wrong, you're a bad person. And, and conveying that, I think, will be impossible. I don't, I don't think we'll ever get that word out to people that don't want to listen. Well, and even if you're a vegan or a vegetarian or whatever, you're still killing animals to eat that food. Oh, yeah. I mean, whether it's pesticides <laughs> or, you know, you're ripping up the ground that's destroying all these nests. I mean, it. Uh, I hate to tell you, but if people want to eat, they're going to have to kill animals to do it mm -hmm. in one form or another. Yeah. Oh, I I mean, any rodent is not in good. They're not safe. right? I mean, but Aaron, don't you works. think, though, it's a rodent's different? For some reason, you know, yeah. like you hear Rogan talk about that a lot. Like, well, what's the difference between smashing a bug versus this? Like, in I feel like the antis just don't calculate that out. This and, was in Yellowstone, actually. I think he said something like, "How cute does an animal have to be before it matters to you if you kill it or not?" Oh, I never seen Yellowstone. Yeah. But that's I like that. And that's that's there's true. And believe me, this is I I have a PhD in shit talking and arguing and I come with both <laughs> barrels loaded to whatever argument I go into and so being in Colorado I have to. Now I don't do it argumentatively and I don't do it in a negative way, but if somebody wants to sit and chit chat on the trail about why I have a bow in my hand, uh, and they're eating beef jerky, I am going to fucking crush you <laughs> in that argument. Do do you run into and, that and, a lot, Aaron? On uh, you know, being in Colorado and where the hippies are, more hippie the more concentrated hippies, like on public uh, ground. What are they, uh, the, uh, yeah, the, <laughs> yeah. I keep the analogies out of it. Yes, I do run I do run into that frequently. Washington is the worst place I've ever seen. Uh Oregon would be second and Colorado. What you know what is what is strange is a lot of them don't want to have an open conversation. Some of them do, but generally it's one end of the spectrum to the other. You go up and they're like, oh, that's awesome. You guys are hiking. Like when I killed my mountain goat, we ran into photographers that, that people hiked in to get wedding photos three and a half miles in. And they talked to, they, they talked to my wife and it, you know, when they went, cause we were up on the stock and the photographer, everything was cool. Mm -hmm. Fast forward. I went on a mountain goat hunt with another guy helping him. And I mean, people were like, you know, like, you know, I have somebody rode on my truck, you know, whatever. There was all kinds of, and no shit. literally when I was like, Hey, you, you, you got, I mean, this again, a different lens, right? I'm like, Hey, uh, what issue do you guys have with hunting? Well, you know, that generally all animals deserve to live. And I'm like, Oh, well, let's dissect that. Right. Are you, you, you're, you're vegan. Yeah. And I'm like, do you eat tofu? Well, of course. I'm like, okay, well, let's talk about what dies making tofu or the wonderful article of cattle, how much water they take in. Mm -hmm. Okay, have anybody ever seen 
like what what when you when you go out there and I, I won't get into the like the, the the meat and potatoes of it too much. When you what I, I call them turns, whatever you want to call it, when they're um, watering a field to make tofu, that is way more than cattle drink. Like if and you can ask any farmer and cattle rancher when when they're watering those fields, especially in places that are drier like Oklahoma and Texas. Mm-hmm. That's that's far more than what it, it, to make tofu than what the cattle. pivots, right? I don't even know what tofu is. Is it soybeans? Yeah. So uh, yeah. what you're talking about is basically water shortages in Western yeah. states. Here in the Midwest, we're not regulated on water usage, but in a lot of Western states, you are. So yeah, do you want to? I mean, you're going to water your tofu, or you're going to water? You know, you're going to let the cattle drink. Which one's more efficient? Mm-hmm. I think it's the argument that's trying to be made here. Yeah, that's a good point. I never thought about that. Yeah. So you talk about like a a, a pivot. Um, it's basically, it's got a bunch of big wheels, a bunch of big pipe water coming out of it. Chandler Pretty owns tough. a couple pivots, I think. <laughs> got a few, more than I want. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, for the people listening in, those pivots to make tofu out of, out of soy, um, it, not just the water, which is one argument for cattle, how much they drink, but also, I mean, when you see the machinery go over to, you know, harvest uh, that, I mean, Everything is dying, not everything, pretty much everything is dying from snakes to spiders, bugs, rodents, everything. But yep. that's okay for whatever reason. Well, mostly because they're oblivious. Um, yeah. Like polar bears. Well, they only drink Coke with their paws. <laughs> well, watch a polar bear fight and watch a polar bear eat the, its young so it can breed again. Yeah. That little white fuzzy, fuzzy little bastard isn't quite so cool anymore when it's covered in blood from eating its baby so it can have sex again. Yeah. They don't think about that. It's pretty gangster. (laughs) It's pretty gangster. Um, How do you feel in general, Aaron, about the hunting internet community? Like, if you had to scale up from a 1 to 10, where do you think it's at in in this current state? Oh, man, that's a tough one. I would say that I would say it is getting better. You think it's getting Um, better? So I'm surprised to hear that, to be honest. And I don't know why, but I kind of do. Well... (laughs) You know, you know how it is with when you when you have an article like you know uh, Matt wrote, um, you know things like that. It does help you kind of or not or hurt you however you want to look at it. Alter maybe that perspective you have at that point. You know, just like PTSD, whatever. You know, you burn your hand on a stove. Like you're gonna have a bad day. Well, yeah. You have um, you know those articles. All of a sudden, you you're thinking about all these negative things, and maybe Matt was right. Maybe he had a point or. Whatever, but when you look at it, the reality of it is there are more spheres of influence in the outdoor community today that non-hunters see that are, are pushing the, the correct light, a positive light in hunting. When you, I say that, Rogan's one. Rogan's uh, number Rinella, one. Rogan's one. Ranella, there's some other things I got to talk with Steve about and kind of get my head wrapped around, but he is a great voice. You know, he goes over the cooking and everything else, yeah. you know, and, and, and non-hunters see that. Cam. I, I I like Cam. I think Cam does an amazing job. He's a great spokesman. And he, you know, the athlete side of things, CrossFit. Um, a lot of different people in the CrossFit community are getting into or 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 have been hunting. Uh, and again, positive light. So if you look at it from some bimbo with their you know boobies hanging out holding a fish, yeah, I mean that's probably not good, right? Or some ding dong holding ducks in his mouth. Yeah, probably not good. But there is more positive by far because how many anti-hunters are actually looking hard at at, at uh, some dude holding a duck in his mouth in yeah. comparison to Rogan is bigger than CNN. Well, shit, you and I are bigger than CNN at this point. They suck so much. But you get the <laughs> right. point. Right, um, right. You know, and so you those people are purposefully listening to Rogan and getting good content out of it. You yeah. got to look pretty hard. You got to know where to look to find the negative. You and I, uh, us three, we know where to look. Right, so it of course. Seems worse than it is, mm-hmm. and that's why I say I think it's getting, you know, better because um, I have had more people get a hold of me. You know, were you on Joe Rogan? Um, oh yeah, are you a bow hunter? No, man, I'm a mechanic across the street, but I listen to Rogan, dude. That's awesome. What you do? You sleep 150 nights on the ground, dude. That's gangster. Well, that's good. Yeah, right? cool. Nothing wrong with that pretty badass okay nobody's ever yeah you're on instagram 
I hate people that hold ducks in their mouths. I've never heard that shit, right? So I, I think it is getting better. That's a good point. I like your perspective on that, and I think you are 100% correct. By the way, um, Rogan reached out. He actually messaged Austin about the whole photo debacle, which was kind of cool. Um, yeah, we knew it was making a pretty big stink in the industry when it landed on his desk within 24 hours of when we posted it. Yeah. Um, yeah, w w pretty cool. Um, I guess cool, right? It, it ended up being a positive thing. Yeah, I, it wasn't a good thing that it made that much bad publicity that it landed there, but it was cool to get his perspective. And then when he sided with us, that was very refreshing. Yeah, super refreshing. Um, but Aaron, I like I like your perspective on that, man, because I feel... Like, we're, like Austin kind of mentioned earlier, we're we're new to the. Uh, I don't want to use the term mainstream, but you know what I'm saying. We're new to the the more of the popular side of the industry. When before I felt like we were more underground, if that makes any sense. So you get a bunch of guys that aren't anywhere near a city, and then you know we're, we're just not used to it, really. But uh, your perspective on like Rogan is awesome. And I always thought Rogan was the most powerful voice anyway, because he's the biggest, right? He's like the most famous dude on the planet. And I, go ahead. I, I, no, I just, I, can't, I, I, to dig a little deeper into this, who does not like cam right now that you know of Cameron Haynes. Um, yeah, Cameron. I don't, I don't really know anybody that's like pissing on him, you know, like maybe just uh, some okay, of the so internet troll pages. That's about it. Internet troll pages, haters, whatever, which do not matter. Generally, they're lesser men, uh, what I would say, jealous, however you want to look at it, or just shit stir. Uh -huh. It has nothing to do with hunting, with meaning our hunting rights and what we all love. For sure. Reality, when I hear people say Cam's bad for hunting, I'm like, okay, chucklehead, uh, let's hear it. Give it to me. I, I, let's yeah. talk about this because there is no way a dude that's on – in, in, in freaking Dick Sporting Goods on a 16 by 24 foot photo, carrying a bow is bad. No, that's right? good. That's, that's all bad. good. And oh, he's way too uh, arrogant about his running. Oh, yeah, I'm sure that's the first thing that some dude that ran with him in the Boston Marathon is thinking is, oh, he's bad for hunting because he runs too much. Right. It, it's, it's jealousy. Well, there's so a thing again, where people get too big. Like if someone's a fan of a band that's underground and then all of a sudden the band makes it big time, for some reason that person, a lot of those people are usually like, well, fuck them. They got too big. Well, it's like, <laughs> well, what the fuck did you want for them? You know, like, mm -hmm. how, what do you want? I don't know. I don't like that attitude. I feel like it's easy to fall into that. But and maybe I think some of that's going on with Cam because he's buddies with Rogan. Does that, I don't know if that makes oh. sense. No, it, it, it does. And I'm, you know, I'm in much smaller than those, um, you know, those guys, but I, you know, because I'm polarizing and all that, you know, and I don't disagree with that. I'm a unique personality. So, yeah. but do you really think an anti hunter that looks at my photography is like, Oh, he's horrible. You know, this guy's horrible for hunting. Uh, we, we're going to go after the hunting community because he's polarizing. No, they're looking at my photos thinking, Oh, I guess this guy's just not a knuckle dragging redneck. <laughs> right. He actually takes great photos, you know. Right. So again, most of that is internal shit that doesn't really matter. We may try to make it matter when I say we others in the, in the community, mm -hmm. but I've never seen Cam post anything in a negative light towards hunting. You right. know what I mean when it comes to anti or neutral hunters. Yeah. Uh, same with Rogan and and many others. And I only bring up Cam because I'm a big advocate of cam and I used to be a hater cause I had a tiny penis and that's like, <laughs> fucking how life works. Right. But once I got out of my own mind, used to have a tiny know, penis for good. the record. <laughs> I know. Well, I just bought a truck that's like way tiny penis. I truck fuckers like got seven inches of lift. So it shrunk again. Oh, no, uh, well. My wife likes it. That's all that matters. So, <laughs> right. But you, you did what I'm shoveling. It's like, yeah. okay, well you take yourself out of the equation, the ego, you know, jealousy, you put yourself in a lot different perspective. It, it gives you For a sure. lot different perspective. And when you talk about people making it in the industry, like you guys or Cam or Ranella or Rogan or you know, whoever else, tons of guys, none of them didn't work really hard to get there. It wasn't handed to them. Right. Okay, so what's that to say? Stop focusing on the negative shit. Strap some fucking shoes on her boots. Get out there. Rub some dirt in your crotch and move forward and work your ass off. Mm -hmm. It's the people that are jealous that don't want to do that. Because, I mean... Where did you get, how did you guys get to where you were? Did hustle, somebody just yeah, give you hustling. a billion dollars and said, hey, start a podcast, we'll pay for it. Oh, hustle and never skipped a week. Yeah, so hard work. Hard work. And, and people, for, people forget about that. 
Um, the they forget about it perfect. real fast, you know, and it's it's unfortunate, man. But I mean, what do you do? The 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 good thing for folks like you and I and people with other um, open platforms, I guess what I'll call it. Like, you know what? The, if you just have a TV show and not a podcast, it's hard to kind of vent and explain things rationally through conversation where you know we're both podcasters we have that opportunity to like talk through like austin's buck we did a whole episode if someone really cared that much and i know the antis are not going to listen to the podcast which we don't really care if they do or they don't we don't care and the haters that are just shitting on us for whatever reason aren't going to listen yeah. the people that saw that picture and were shocked by it and wanted to hear the actual story they get the opportunity to hear that exact story within two days of when i shot that deer right and we can talk through the entire situation and all the details yep. and all our mindsets and throughout processes and stuff like that um Aaron, I know you didn't get into it, but I and if you don't want to talk about it, I, I get it. Um I, I'm a fan of Steven Ranella and Meat Eater, I am, but I know like that whole like churning group controversy like is like a big concern of a lot of people. Um have, I don't know if you know him personally or not. Have you have you ever talked to him about it or what's your thoughts on it? So um and I'll go into this to a, a, a not, not as deep as I will later on because I, I want to talk to Steve in more depth. Yeah, um, with all due respect, I we, guess we, we should say. No, well, no, I mean, i huge fan of Steve to a certain point. When that happened, I was a little skeptical. He's surrounded by pretty left-leaning guys. Makes me nervous, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had voiced my opinion, not in a negative way, but just saying, hey, this is a concern of mine, whatever. Anyway, we, Steve and I talked the other day. He was heated. Um, and I'm like, dude, I, I, I'm not lying. It's a concern of mine, bro. Like, I, mm -hmm. you were somebody I admired in the industry, and there's not very many people – that I admire in the industry mm -hmm. and that scares me to death. Mm -hmm. And we, we hugged it out, figured it out. I think he's going to hop on the podcast. Um, there's many ways to look at this. And, and Steve brought a few of them up to me, which I already, I kind of halted him and was like, dude, you're not going to bring up anything that I haven't heard before. You know, where's your iPhone come from? Is, is Ford completely backed by pro hunters, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And in the way that I looked at it and I told him, I was like, yeah, but I, I didn't, you know, sign a contract with Ford. Right. right. Now, with venture capital, it is much more complex than people realize as far as the, the, the money portion of it. Mm -hmm. But you got to weigh it out at some point. And this is where I want to talk to Steve in a lot more depth is, is the good he's doing outweigh a little bit of potential bad. So if you took a dollar and you cut the top tiny fraction of that dollar off, and that went to potentially going back to anti-Second Amendment and anti-predator hunting, is what he does good – far outweigh that little fraction of that dollar. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to discuss with him because, you know, Jason Phelps is a brother to me. Mm -hmm. He was bought out by, you know, that entity. And Jason and I talked about it and, and you know, we had a good talk, right? And and what I did, Steve a disservice, I didn't I didn't talk to him early enough. And I told him that. Yeah. I was like, dude, I apologize. I should have hashed this out with you earlier. But when you when you look at certain things that are – when you dig deeper into this, and this has nothing to do with Steve, but things to think about, mm -hmm. what camo do you guys wear? We wear Huntworth currently. Okay. We know they're pro hunting, right? Mm -hmm. What socks do you wear? Carhartt, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Farm okay. to feet. Well, you know what I mean? Yeah. You, you get, yeah. I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Are, are they pro? Are we digging in deep enough in other ways and other aspects of this? That we the, giving it the due diligence, Steve's in a spotlight, so of course we're going to dig into him deeper. Of course, yeah. But maybe we should take a look at ourselves and say, okay, um, and I don't, let's say jet boil. I am not a fan of jet boil stoves because I know at the root of it, mm -hmm. they don't like hunters. Now, they may sell to hunters because they like hunters' money, but you go to the OR show and talk, South Cox, I don't know if you guys are familiar with him, no. a mm -hmm. an assassin for mule deer in the high country. Uh, Chandler owns, knows him. Stalker stick bows. Yeah, the, yeah, the long bow that I shoot, he okay. makes it. I've, yeah. yeah, I'm not a tra traditional guy, so I'm kind of out of the loop on that. So he he didn't think I was telling the truth. Well, lo and behold, 2019 went to the OR show. He bought an MSR reactor right after his conversation with Jetboil. Hmm. But there are thousands of hunters that run Jetboil. Yeah, that's so, the. Po I mean, I, I I've never run one, but I know the brand. It's funny, Aaron. You brought you bring up Jetboil. Um, I remember before. I don't have a Jetboil brand one. I have one very similar to it. Uh, my wife and I looked that up to see if they were um, uh, pro or anti hunting, and I thought I and I might be wrong on this, so nobody quote me. It's been I looked it up before I went on my Wyoming mule deer hunt um, in September that the 
the previous owners used to be anti hunting, but the new owners are not. And they were trying to like rebrand it. And maybe I'm incorrect on that, but that's what I thought we read. Um, with jet boil. Yeah. And that, you know what? That could be, you know, I'm going up to 2018, 19 times. Okay. I might be way it fucking wrong. I don't know, but I'm whatever. It doesn't matter. I, you, you I, I think black diamond is actually might be who you're talking about, but either way, it doesn't matter. You get you get the point. For sure. Is are we dissecting all of these other things that could be a net bad all the way around? Mm -hmm. Where when you look at Steve and what he's doing, do you have to kind of look past that fraction of that dollar yeah. for all the good that Steve has done, and that's a lot of fucking good. Yeah. Yeah. And, Go ahead. Sorry. No, no. I just even uh, me. You know, I told him like, dude, I'll eat crow if I need to. I don't give a shit. I eat crow all the time. Like. Let's talk about this because well, I don't know what he realizes is my inbox is full as anti meat eater or questions and things like that. And it's like, mm -hmm. dude, let's not do the mental gymnastics things you did. Let's talk about what's the reality. And when I say mental gymnastics, I don't mean that as a slight. Steve is an intelligent guy. Of course. And when he, he may surpass someone's monkey brain like mine when he discusses it or talks about it. So I'm like, hey, let's talk about the meat and potatoes of this. Mm -hmm. Let's say a small fraction of that dollar does go back into the churning group. Is right. what you are doing outweighing that? And that is a very valid discussion and, a, and something to think about. I think it is too. And I'll definitely be listening to that podcast because I'm curious. Um, I'm a fan of Steve Ranella. You know, I'd, uh, you know, I think a year ago, if you'd have been like, who's the president of hunting? I'd be like, well, I'd vote Steve Ranella and, you know, yeah. to be our spokesperson. Um, I think my concern, I think with it, and I, I, if you do record a podcast with them, it'll probably answer this question. I hate the idea of us. And I, I get that. Like, well, you drive a Ford, maybe they're anti hunting this, this, and that, you know, whatever brand you wear, whatever I'm wearing right now. Um, I, I think the idea of people, I think people have a problem with the idea of being infiltrated from the inside out as a hunting community is the problem, you know? And, and, but I get it though. It's like maybe we're not really being infiltrated, but it it sort of seems that way from the the headlines, which is easy to conclude from, right? So I I, I would say infiltrated would would not. I would say Steve and I align on probably ninety eight percent of our views. Mm -hmm. There are people around Steve that are so far to the left they have to look to the left to see the right. Gotcha. Uh, and I, yeah. I would I would like Steve to talk me out of that because I. I I've heard and it, it seems whatever, that way know, from seeing things. comments on the internet and like banter back and forth with some of the mediator crew that I've seen with yeah. people, you know, on yeah. the right. It, it, exactly. And, and that's not this, you know, that, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that Steve and Steve does run the show for sure. And yeah, again, for sure. things I want to talk about and be very candid with him. And I want him to be very candid as well. Like, um, okay. Only bolt guns and shotguns. If they are pushing that, yeah, not a fan. That would be a reason alone. Steve could be my best friend, and I would be like, dude, I like AR-15s. I have been to many third world countries. Have you? Because mm -hmm. you're taking it from a blind perspective being from wherever you're from in the cute little world you live in. But what about if that world goes bad or whatever you want to look at? Or you hunt coyotes. I like having to be able to squeeze the trigger multiple times when I hunt coyotes. I don't want to just jack a bolt back and stuff. <laughs> right. So – Again, Second Amendment. If they are against the Second Amendment, which is the right to bear arms of, of you know, semi-automatic weapons and, you know, so on and so forth, you guys understand. Yep. If they're against that, yes, I got a problem with that. It's a big and, problem. And that has nothing, yeah, that has nothing to do with the churning group or anything else. I, I wouldn't give a shit if you work for Sitka, Cryptic, Kuyu, or, you know, you whatever. Huntworth. I have an issue with that because I am very patriotic and very pro second amendment. Mm -hmm. Now, do I think every chucklehead on the planet or in the United States needs a gun? Fuck no. There's tons of people that don't need a gun or a driver's <laughs> license for that matter. Right. But the general principle, if you're mentally sound, you should be able to carry whatever weapon you want right now. Semi-automatic 30 round magazine. I don't give a shit. I think you should be able to carry that if Agreed. you are mentally sound. Amen. Ag Agreed. Agreed. And, and you know, me saying this too, Aaron, I know, and I know you know, but I'm kind of saying this to our listeners and people tuning in that maybe new listeners that are tuning in because you're on. Um, I, I'm a fucking idiot on a lot of things. And me being, you know, saying that about Ranella, 
if I got offered the same money that whatever Chernin offered him for working class, I'd probably fucking do it because I'm I'm broke. broke. <laughs> You're broke. <laughs> I'm, I'm broke. <laughs> he, you know, we talked about that a little bit. I mean, not exactly that, but um, you know, uh, you know, just general. This had nothing to do with uh, you know Chernin Group or Meat Eater, but um, you know what? Where where? How would I look at this? Um, if I, I do have a financial backer, he's one of my best friends. Obviously, we are parallel on everything. If I had a financial but come to me, a backer come to me, not owning Kafaru, just Aaron Snyder, my name and the designs and everything else that I know, mm-hmm. and was like, okay, we're going to give you $10 million to start a company right now. And they're like, yep, we love hunting. We love, you know, whatever. They list off all of these things. One of the things they are very pro is introduction of wolves. Hmm. Am I going to take the 10 million or am I going to stand my ground? Cause I am not in actually, I shouldn't say that totally. My issue is with the control of wolves, or right. the management of wolves is where it goes to shit. You get the yeah. point though. Yep. I do. Am I going to take that money or am I not? Well, I don't know because my business partner agrees with everything I think. So I never have been put in that position, but if I was, that's a very good conversation to have. Where, where, where do you say, okay, I can change so many lives with all of this money with a backpack company and gear and my sphere of influence. And we're going to start a podcast and they're going to have three cameramen that we can do all this video content and all of the, the crap that we're doing right now. And we're all broke, which <laughs> right. we want money though. Right. What would I make that decision and say, well, I'm going to just kind of overlook this wolf thing. Fuck. I don't know. I mean, I couldn't answer that. I couldn't answer it with Steve back. Cause I'm like, ah, that's a good question. <laughs> it's tough, man. And I think, I don't know. I think a lot of people, you know, I don't know, 50, 50, there's people that be like, fuck that. I wouldn't take the money. It's just, mo-. and I'm Until like, Until they're faced with that kind of money. Right. You know, those, <laughs> those same people never be in that situation. Right. They don't have anything. And here's, here's the question. I have turned down a lot of money for piss poor products, financial backing, and it may not have been their views. I may not have just liked the guys or what, but I have, but I have not turned down the money we're talking about. And that's right. the question is, oh yeah, I, I would, you know, I, I've i turned down, well, I went to a recurve and I don't know how much money I would have kept making shooting a compound, right? I don't make any shoot a recurve. <laughs> right. That's a lot different than here's $10 million. And hats off to Way you, sir. Different. Yeah, definitely hats off to you for that. <laughs> yeah, but you, but I, I, you never know till you're walking in that shoe. So if I was going out of business, if I, Kafara was going bankrupt tomorrow, and uh, this has nothing to do with Steve. It's hypothetical. Yeah. Before I was going bankrupt, I've got 43 people that I look at as my family and children. And there I'm going to have to kick them off the street January 1st. And someone comes in and says, I love you and what you do. I love your team. I love what you stand for. But I don't like AR-15s. Fuck, I wouldn't be able to sleep. <laughs> like what? Yeah. I mean, it, I, I, because of my family, because of the people yeah. that work under me. And, I, I would say that anybody says I would turn that down, including me, because I mean I'm leaning towards I, I find another way. What if there was no other way? What you get, decision you would you make? You got to take the money. I yeah. mean, it's well, just kind of I don't know. What do you do? It's it, tough. I man. guess it depends on what issue. Yeah, that that Second Amendment would be a tough one. To, that'd be a tough pill to swallow. It'd be tough. Yeah, it'd be tough. But at it, the end it, of the it, day, man, I, I, you got to eat. But that I hope Steve listens to this because I, I I am not anti or pro. I am more like. I want well. He's a smart fucker, and he likes to to not. He likes to debate, and I love that. Mm-hmm. I he w- would if if that was a, a a choice Steve was faced with, and the, and when he may, had that choice, he thought, okay, I got to make a hard decision, but I can do so much good with this hard decision I have to make if I choose to to do you know take the money or do whatever. Mm-hmm. And you can't say he is not making a difference now. Yeah. Are there other things going along the lines that, you know, might, might worry people or whatever? And that's, again, that's why I want to get them on and talk about it is I, I don't, I am very pro Steve Ranella. Mm-hmm. I, other things are what worry me I hear or, or make me, you know, have questions about it. And so, I think and that's I fair, to man. Explain that to him. I just don't think he believed me, but whatever. Well, I think that's <laughs> fair. Cause I think, you know, I, he won't, I doubt he listens to this episode, but if he does, he can't, he has to get it like, the conversation we're having, he's kind of be like, oh, I get what they're, I get what they're getting at. He's a smart dude. Now I'll tell you this: I'd be nervous as fuck to question Steve Rennell on it because he's so intelligent and so well spoken. That's why he's so 
Like, that's why we love them as an industry. Yeah, that's the guy we need talking for. That is the guy we need talking for, 100%. Um, But I'm a fucking idiot. So even if he was 100% wrong and I was right and I tried to argue him, (laughs) I'd still be fucking wrong because I'm going to lose. I'm going to (laughs) lose. So I'm just not the guy for that interview. I am I am the guy. I, uh, I as much as I like to pretend to be a knuckle dragger, I educate again. I I go to, to battle with the weapons loaded, not not weapons loaded. But yeah. you know I, mean? I I will have talking points and, and different questions and things like that. And I'm no, I'm not saying I'm as smart as Steve, but I think it would be a good conversation because one, I could probably dumb it down a little bit when when people might be confused. I do that That's on my podcast all the time. That's what we need. You know. Somebody will say something. We had Brandon Lilly on, a power lifter, giant dude, and he starts talking about bench shirts, and I'm like, hold on, dude. 99% of people <laughs> listening in don't even know what a bench shirt is, or or we start breaking down steroids and diet and whatever, yeah, yeah. because I came from the knuckle dragger all the way up, and so I, I, I don't take those things for granted because I know when it was presented to me at one time, I had no clue what the dude was talking about. Now I do. Yeah. I can break it down how I needed to be broken down to me at that specific time when I dove into it. And, then, and also, you know, with I'm saying this with all due respect here, Aaron, so <laughs> I know you won't be offended. You're older. You have more experience in this game. You've hunted more places. You've seen more terrain. You've met more people. You own a huge business. You know what I mean? You're successful in the community. You've done a lot of things. You're the guy for that interview, not a dude from Illinois who's young to the game. You know what I mean? If that makes any sense. What? Well, it, it, well, I, I, it's just uh, what you brought up, the business, you know, how long I've done it, coming from the background I have. I mean, the other thing, you know, looking at, um, you know, some of these different perspectives we're, we're kind of hitting on tonight when we, you know, we talked about the, the community and is it bad or good and the influencers and all the others, anti-hunters. And then we talked about Steve and Matt Steele. Well, when you look at someone um, – uh, like like a, a, a Steve Ranella or a, a Rogan or or whoever else, or a, let's say a Donnie Benson. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw Donnie on Joe Rogan talk about he was watching wolves eat mice and they didn't eat caribou. Well, okay, I like Donnie. I consider Donnie a friend. But if my wife cooks fish, but I want elk, well, I'm eating fucking fish. Okay, well, <laughs> if there's only mice around... They have to live. They're going to eat mice. So it's like, okay, let's look at a, you know, I don't think he hit that subject well enough. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. uh, So when you look at somebody, as we look at Steve, I had Trump Jr. on the podcast. Everybody that was on the right side loved that podcast. If we dissect anything that Jr. or, or his family has done, if we dig hard enough, I bet we can find some anti Second Amendment money in that mix. Um, if, if that makes any sense, yeah. I bet we can look and, and entities that, that maybe he, you know, Trump Jr. works with that are, you know, I'm not saying we're going to, I'm just thinking that we probably will, mm-hmm. but we're overlooking that because, um, he is not in the position when I say that Trump Jr. is huge, right. But not in the hunting position that Steve is now I could be totally wrong. And Don may call me and say, you're a fucking idiot, but you get my point. We For need sure. to look into everything, not just Steve mm-hmm. uh, or and we're talking about Steve, but you know, or others. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. And I'm, I'm guilty of that sometimes. And I, and I, you know, I told Steve that I'm like, yeah, you know, dude, I, let's, let's talk about it. And again, I don't think he believed me, but I have spoke very highly of what Steve has done for the outdoor community. The other part, I just think we need to d- discuss. So anyway, I won't beat a dead horse to death. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've, we've talked about it for a while. I think it's healthy conversation. There might be a lot of people who are like, I don't give a fuck about this conversation. I get that. But I think it's healthy, right? Like, it's probably better. It's, we're kind of have like a, a self-help industry <laughs> therapy session a little bit. But I think it's all healthy <laughs> stuff to talk about. And I think it's healthy for consumers of content to think about it. Um, so I don't I don't think it's – I think it's important. Well, what arrows do you guys shoot? We're shooting victories. Okay. Who owns Victory? Mitsubishi. I don't know where they stand in hunting, but I would be afraid to look. I don't know. Yep, that's but a good point. And again, I only said it's one hell of an arrow, and Mitsubishi are carbon geniuses. So mm-hmm. as I, I want to throw some context in that, they make they are amazing arrow. They, they are amazing at what they do, and because of Mitsubishi and the technology they have in carbon, 
but I don't know where Mitsubishi stands with hunting, and right. I haven't looked, which is bad on me. Yep, mm-hmm. I should. And bad on us too, but yeah, because do you really think they give it? They're making money from hunters. Yay! You know they don't like anti pro whatever. We love money. They may not give a shit if they're making. You know, hunters are buying. You know, they may not stand strong and we're anti. We're not going to focus on hunting. They may be like, ah, fuck it. We're going to get millions of dollars from hunters. And I'm not. I am not saying at all they're that like that. I'm just using it as an example. Hundred percent. I have yeah, never dug point. into that, and I should. Yeah, and I'm with you there. I'm. I'm. You know, we're right in that boat, and I bet you almost every other TV show, podcast, company is kind of in that same situation as well. It's, and and I get it. It's, you know, it's like if we're gonna pick apart Ranella, when do we start turning around and pick apart everything we fucking do? Um, it's tough, man. That's what that's what makes a good conversation something to think about. Oh, no, and again, I, I really hope I get to chat with Steve because I've always admired what he does, um, what he was able to do, where he came from, how well-spoken he is. And, you know, I don't agree with everything you know he says, nor do I agree with everything Brogan says. Or, or quite honestly, if I listen to you guys more, I'd probably be like, ah, fuck that, right? But <laughs> right. you guys are going to agree with everything I say. Yeah. So that's p- just part of life. Just I mean, being a human being, man. Within- yeah, I mean, shit, I don't agree with everything Frank says, and I'm stuck with that fucker every day, right? He's mm-hmm. my partner in crime. Or, and, and I think we can get past that, though, or you you better be able to talk about it and become, a, become, become an understanding of it and, and, you know, come to an understanding and move forward. Now, one thing I want to touch on, you guys had um, um, uh, Mike on Make Hunting Great again a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, he used to like me. He doesn't like me anymore. Um, yeah, I'm friends <laughs> with Copper Plate at Sixes. Yeah. Well, it was just, it's stupid because you know, I had something with a buddy of mine out east, and I really didn't give a fuck. But anyway, <laughs> copper plated. Yeah, um, I follow him. I, I enjoy I, his page, to be honest with you. Yeah, exactly. Now, is he going about it the right way? Hmm. I don't know, but he's doing a pretty good job of pointing things out that sh- should probably be pointed out. Mm-hmm. Do you guys think, and this was brought up to me in a podcast on Blood Origins, we all should stick together no matter what. If you're a hunter, even if you're holding ducks in your mouth, we should all be in the same, you know, we should all support each other. Mm-hmm. Do you guys agree with that or disagree? I'm in a weird spot with that because, like, it goes back to it just looks bad. You know, here's the thing. I would probably have the conversation, like, some people reached out to us about this rib cage coyote buck. Hey, man, you probably shouldn't post that. Here's why. All right, I get it. And that's probably what I would do. Now, do I necessarily agree with like blasting the fuck out of them on everything? Probably not. So I don't yeah, know if that answers yeah, the that, question or not. I, that, well, I, that's kind of, I, I, you know, I told him I didn't want to hurt my ball sack sitting on a fence, but I pretty much answered <laughs> it the same way. I was like, I, I, you know, do, are there people we need to kick out of the industry? Fuck yes. For sure. They're there. But what you guys did, no, I mean that—that that was a a, a, deci- a conscious decision you made that could maybe may have been a bad one. Mm-hmm. And you guys talked about it. You know, yeah, maybe, maybe you know, yeah, could, probably could have done it different. Move on, right? Yep. It, it doesn't matter, right? That's a, a just a little speed bump in in life. Yeah. Now, someone that could give two shits about conservation but hashtags it, could care less about the animal or just that passion. Not you know, not the same kumbaya, but. I have dedicated my life to the outdoors. Mm-hmm. I am passionate about everything. I, I mean, I literally have been divorced three times, married, you know, married four, and a lot of that was because of hunting, right? I mean, the outdoors. Mm-hmm. I'm passionate about it. If someone gets into it for fame, uh, for glory, you know, uh, yeah, however you want to look at it, and the moment social media ends, they're not going to hunt anymore. Uh, there's an argument there to kick them off the boat. Yeah, fuck right? them. They're not there for help. They're, yeah, they're not there to help us. Mm-hmm. And, and the guys, people that are for real can kind of pick those guys out. I mean, the people that have been in the game and really are there for the right reasons are the guys that are, you know, congratulating when they should be. And For sure. Yeah. They're shining now. you out. said guys. Yeah, let's let's talk about our pronouns. No, I'm just fucking with you. But <laughs> it's girls, too, right? I mean, it's not just guys. It's almost there's worse. There's plenty of women out there. Yeah, I was just going to say, when you said guys, and I know you didn't mean that, you know, whatever, but I, I there are a lot of um, women that I see that are coming in for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. Christy Titus is one. She's raised honey. I've heard nothing right, but she's not just, just kick-ass stuff about her. Oh, yeah, she's a live wire. She, she's 
and she's not just coming in the industry. Uh, Melissa Bachman. Melissa uh, Bachman's a one shit. That, yep. Yeah, you know, for the right reasons. I'm not going to mention the ones I don't want to mention, mm-hmm. uh, or the ones when I say that the negative ones because I don't want to get into a shit storm and have to my fucking email box fill up. But there are people <laughs> out here, out in the industry, that only get on there to just suck up sponsors, try to make a living, and don't give two shits about the outdoors, the beauty yeah. of it, the you know the adventure conservation you know they don't give a shit mm-hmm. yeah get them off the boat i don't want them on my boat amen and, you know and, and, and that's kind of how i look at it and so like what matt did what was so irritating about that i don't take sponsors they listed me i think i might have made 13 right i'm crushing it whatever number i was on the worst fucking hunter for you know the outdoor industry they put kafar was my sponsor on the fucking company so, what, i was like it's wait tough. to do your research guys yeah, yeah like oh good job and then, you know, when you look at that, I don't take sponsors, right? I mean, I do get, I, I designed trad veins for AAE. I got some money from that. But, I mean, you guys see, I may shoot five bows in six months. Mm-hmm. Well, they don't pay me for a month, right? I mean, that's me testing gear to get the word out on what's good, what's bad, or whatever. Right. And, again, I don't know if they realize my age. I didn't have cell phones, range finders. There was no internet. When I started, you know, I'm 40, well, I'm almost 45. And when social media is gone, which I have an exit strategy, I'm going to be doing the same shit I did right now, except I don't have to answer questions or deal with fucking people with horrible fucking views on the outdoors. That's my I'm guy go right back there. I'm going to doing what I yeah. love. Yeah. And, and so for me to be on that list, along with others, Cam's no different. It's like, dude, do you really think that I belong on that list along with many other? Fred Eichler? Yeah, Fred Eichler takes a ton of money to, uh, you know, for sponsors and things like that. But he's not bad for the outdoors. No way. Fred, I mean, that Fred might be the one of the best, man. Yeah. I mean, who the who else shoots a fucking forked horn in the Golden Triangle for the love of the game? Only Fred. Right. Right. I mean, no one's going. I mean, I've seen that dude shoot some little shit in places he should not be shooting forked horns because <laughs> he is so excited about hunting. Right. How can you say he's bad? He's not a trophy hunter. He's in it for the love right. of of the outdoors and the hunt. So 100%. Uh, again. If you get one bad cop, that doesn't mean all cops are bad. One bad game warden, one bad doctor, that doesn't mean that all doctors suck. You just got a bad yeah, apple. For no sure. No different. We got some bad apples. For sure. Yeah, and I'll be honest. I never saw, I actually read the uh, Matt's article, and I think it's funny he had a list. Um, but, and I like how you say, you know, like before social media, like we were all hunting, you know, I'm the youngest out of the three of you guys now, but there were, I hunted before social media, whether people want to believe it well, or not. Well, that's the big question. Like, would we act this way if the spotlight wasn't on us? I mean, fuck, fucking right we would. Fuck yes. I guarantee you I'd be back there hanging stands and checking cameras yeah. and doing the exact same thing I did this year if we weren't in the limelight. 100%. Guaranteed. 100%. Well, and also I think it's hard to bullshit. I mean, maybe it's not, but it's hard to bullshit for us. Like, imagine if we were just faking it and we we're bullshitting the entire life of working class bow on our podcast, almost 500 episodes in. We're not <laughs> passionate about it. You think we'd have the steam to keep it up? I think people realize yeah, that we're pretty say, genuine. You don't make enough money to bullshit. There's right, got to no. be a reason why you're bullshitting. And I'm not saying you guys don't make money, but I mean, you're doing it for the love of it, to get the story out, to put hunting in a positive light, all, all that, right? hundred percent. Yep, exactly. So, um, when, 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 you know, kind of rewinding, I get pretty passionate about this. I have an exit strategy as the company grows and I've been able to do YouTube videos and podcasts and, you know, cause eventually, you know, my company gives me crap all the time cause I hate being on camera. I hate being on my camera because when I'm hunting, that is my only place of peace I have left. Mm-hmm. I can't go to a store anymore, a trailhead, a shop, and I don't mind talking to people or whatever else, but my last place of peace is eight miles deep with 65 pounds on my back or sitting in a tree stand, and I just don't want to be filmed. I want to be left alone. And so once I get to a point, the company's doing well, you know, maybe somebody else takes kind of the face frank of the company, and I've gotten enough, I think I've done enough to help the outdoor industry I'm getting out, right? And when I say getting out, I mean, like, I'm going to go back to, let's say, 2008, you know, where, well, I'm going to go back to 2008 with a lot more money, um, <laughs> so I can go on a lot more hunts. But right. you get my point. And so for somebody to call someone out like like me specifically on that, it's like, we have talked about this on many different podcasts that 
I don't get filmed because I, I, I that's my place of peace. Mm-hmm. If I wanted to, whatever, shake my ass and make take lots of fall, I, I would do more video. Mm-hmm. They're very powerful. They don't go away. And so if I was really out there to grab likes and all the other shit he said, I would certainly love for people to stop hounding me and I would just get on the video and suck up more likes and potentially, you know, air quotations, more money and all the other crap they thought I do. If I wanted to take money in the outdoor industry, do you really think that I would act the way I do and use the, all the different products I do? Because I'm doing that to save people money by testing and designing better products. For sure. And also, and I don't know if you have this perspective, but I think I do. I, if you were all, if you were just in it for likes and money, you wouldn't have uh, I'm complimenting you when I say this, the attitude and the like, the openness that you have, because I feel people who are so money driven in the industry aren't open and talk how they want and say things that they want. You know what I mean? Well, the real people can see that and they appreciate people like Aaron or our podcast. Right. I mean, they appreciate the real people. Right. I think there's mm. an obvious factor in there's a some, lot of that. There is people that appreciate that. There are people that fucking hate me, hate me for being the way I am. But well, it's uncomfortable to him. I wanted to. Yeah, I've heard that because I'm honesty is uncomfortable for a lot of people, and and I find it strange because it's how I've was raised and how it's just how I am. But I feel like when you're when you're super direct, people think you're an asshole. And there is some truth to that. I'm very capable of being an asshole. I'm totally candid with saying that. But I'll give you an example because we get we had an email customer service. Uh, somebody got a hold of me on social media, asked me. Um, you know, in a dozen arrows, and it was actually, actually Victory, which I believe is one of the better, better arrows on the mar- market. And I'm a Black Eagle guy. So I'm, I'm saying this, you know, I, if I wanted to make money, I'd talk about Black Eagle more. Um, my arrows aren't within three grains per inch for the entire dozen, or an inch, three grains within the entire dozen. And I'm like, so what, what's the problem? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think that they should warranty and give me my money back. And I think they had called and they asked me cause they wanted a backing on this. And I'm like, yeah, how, how do you, sh- how do you shoot? And they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, can you shoot a Copenhagen lead at 80 yards? No. I'm like, can you hit a paper plate at 40? N- no. And I'm like, well, buddy, you're putting the cart in front of the horse. You need to learn how to shoot. You need to learn the love of the sport and the art of the sport. You need to learn to tune. You need to go back to the drawing board and quit bitching about shit that doesn't matter, dude. You need to put your head down, grind it out, and learn how to shoot before you worry about a dozen arrows being three grains apart. Mm-hmm. But, oh, yeah, we got some hate mail from that one, right? This guy, this guy. you know. And I'm like, dude, I just told you what you needed to hear. You may not have wanted to hear it, but if you're worried about plus or minus three grains and a dozen arrows, but you can't hit a paper plate at 40 yards, I get it that you're unhappy with that arrow, but how do you even know it makes a difference yeah. when you can't hit a paper plate at 40? It's not the and arrow. I, was trying to, <laughs> yeah, I definitely, I sound worse now than I was in the message back to him. I was just like, hey, bro. I was like, that truly, you don't have the ability to make those kind of assumptions that makes a difference. You, you need to have the ability to marry up with your anal retentiveness. Because if, if your anal retentiveness is at a level 10 and your ability is a level 3, you are basically bitching to bitch because you aren't able to shoot. Now, people are going to come back and say, well, he would be a little more accurate if. Okay, but you're missing the point. Mm-hmm. There's other Get boxes better. to check <laughs> before that. There's a lot of us. And, and again, you, you know, I don't. how old are you guys? 31. 38. 38's getting close. The first <laughs> rangefinder on the market was a Bushnell Pro 500. It was the size of my fucking day pack. <laughs> right it was giant we were so happy to have that because i was hunting antelope spot and stock with no range finder. yeah you didn't have to get down and walk your ranges <laughs> yeah like my pace is an exact yard because we didn't have range finders right so i'm right there with I, you I, dude I, and 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 again i i you know being a hypocrite somewhat i dissect gear and let people know what but, but my, my point is is one of the reasons i can judge yardage is I did not have a range finder. Amen. Okay. I so always we, had we a range three, finder. We were 3D shooting back in the mid early 90s when you didn't have a range finder. So you got good at judging yardage without a range finder. I've range find everything I've ever shot at. That's the fun game. You need to go it, out with your buddies and and range without a range well, finder. Oh, we, I have. I have done it. Yep. But and how bad is it on a 3D course when uh, you take the uh, the easy button away? 
It's fucking brutal, dude. That's fun though. But it's so fun. for me, <laughs> when I want to win money, I'm like, all right, boys, no range finders today because I can judge artists. Fucking and you right. Can. And so I'm, that's cool. And so the 280 feet per second, people get wound up on speed. Back in the day, 2312s, 50 grain hot points, aluminum. <laughs> like you just didn't the have hot speed, points, right? dude. I, I forgot about the hot points, the red <laughs> hot points. <laughs> Yeah, hey. you could fart and they would dent. Right? Like this, <laughs> Can I be honest? Like little green. <laughs> yeah. I feel like it, I feel like the kid. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. The red hot points, dude. Oh. They were that's you had to have the red hot points. I don't know what you're talking about. There, there were so, like a red field tip. What? Enlighten me. They were a glue in. They were a glue in point into a tournament arrow made of aluminum. Okay. They were fifty to seventy grains, and you could literally fart and they would dent. But. <laughs> back then 308 was a barn burner right oh that yeah was anything over 300 fast. was just smoking fast and so and again i i never wanted to become the guy of it was uphill both ways and three feet deep of snow but my, my point to this is we are there are so many easy buttons in the industry today mm -hmm. that there are some times that i'm sure i come off like an ass when somebody asked me about a camera setting and i'm like did you read the manual no and i'm like We'll read the manual, and I would almost guarantee that as you learn to use your camera, you will answer the question yourself mm -hmm. by hard work because failure is the best teacher. Right. Right? So, well, well, that too, and also, like, if you're going to ask me a question, do a little bit of research because I know, Aaron, you've gotten this question, and it's probably deep in the inbox somewhere. Hey, what, a, what podcast equipment do you use? Well, and that's funny because I'm like, uh, ask my IT guy because I have no idea. <laughs> okay. I am not smart well, enough. Well, then so I, get a, I, get a, I get a message. Hey, what podcast equipment do you guys use? I'm like, man, dude, you got to Google some shit before it's, you come it's out. It's the same thing with hunting in same general, thing. right? Everybody wants that magic, the magic answer. Like, how do you Let kill me. big deer? I mean, we'll just take that one. Like, you spend 10 or 15 years in the timber uh, figuring it out, you yeah. know, self-taught. That's, so, how, that's how you figure it out. Mm -hmm. Here's the one I love. I got a 29 inch draw. What arrow should I shoot? <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. Actually. So, and, and when I, when I look at that, I know they want to learn. But well, of course. Yeah. If they put effort into learning more than just asking the question, meaning I could give them the entire answer. They wouldn't get as much from me giving them all the answer as they would by, you know, more, in, you know, uh, Googling, you know, which we didn't have back then. There was no Google, right? Like right now, <laughs> Webster's. I can Google yeah, <laughs> Webster's, yeah, I mean, but what's, go, what was the encyclopedias? That's what I meant. Britannica. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you had to learn it on your own, and it never goes away. Mm -hmm. So when I learned to tune, it was hanging out at a pro shop and everything else. And, and I, not everybody has that, and I get that. But my my point is, for those that do have the ability and and the ranges around and everything else, you know try to learn by, by, by failure, you mm -hmm. know, and you'll, and it'll retain more. And, 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 and again, I'm sure I'm sounding like a total asshole with this, but one of the reasons I can judge is what I talked about. One of the reasons that I can navigate is we didn't have GPS is back then. My dad would kick me out of the truck, little fat kid in a sweater with me. <laughs> hey, you know, cause my dad was a bit of a drinker and smoked too much pot and hey. he just wanted me to go away. Right. Run around in circles. Well, I had to find my way back to the truck. Right. So, I had to learn, you know, navigation manually and I was in the military and everything else. How many people do you know that have a GPS and think it's uh, Jack Sparrow's magical compass points to where they want to go? No idea how to use it. But I tell you what, I bet they brag about that thing. I've got the new Garmin 7052. No idea how to use it. Yeah, pick, I don't up, know pick up that anything. atlas and go to Idaho, boy. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, I, I, again learning those things and, and, and you will become a better hunter. You'll become a better woodsman by learning those rather than just, well, I bought the coolest gear in the world. I have no idea to use it. And I brought this up many times. Your cool level of gear has to match. You want it to try to match your skill set in the woods, mm -hmm. you know, and I've had people come at me again, horrible argument. So you're saying if I have a ton of money, that I shouldn't buy good gear. And I'm like, no, that's not what I'm saying for, if that was what you got out of what I said, you totally missed my point. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, don't rely on all that good gear. Also build your knowledge base up to equal it. No, hell no. If you have a ton of money, buy the best gear you can, but don't let that carry you, you know, for sure. Also raise your, you know, your woodsmanship and field craft and all the other stuff. So, 
Aaron, I wanted to ask you one uh, one last thing here while we're kind of on that uh, topic of conversation. What do you think um, from a traditional archery standpoint and, you know, having experience with compounds and everything, what do you think about like the new like Garmin type sites that kind of like range on the fly and reset your site and all that shit for you <laughs> in the site housing? I mean, do you, I'm assuming um, you got to have a strong not, opinion, right? Very strong. Not a fan. Not a fan. Um, Fair. again, it's the easy button and I'm, I'm not going to bring up a guy I used to work with. Well, it makes you a more ethical hunter. And I'm thinking, you know what else does fucking practice slick? Practice. <laughs> right, yep. right. If you're gonna if you're gonna come at me with, I have less of a, a chance of wounding, because it tells me you know whatever. There's some validity to that, but you know what else does that? Hard work. Mm-hmm. Yep. And my pins don't run out of batteries, right? I have to side in, shoot my bow. I have to put more effort into it than that, you know, because that thing basically you throw your arrow weight in and you know whatever else. I mean, it it's it's pretty snappy. So, um. Why, while I, I, I understand the concept behind it, and I'm a very large advocate of a lot of what Garmin does, that site literally is, is one of the, it makes people lazier than they should be. I think you should learn to tune and all the other stuff. But sighting your bow in is part of the journey, mm-hmm. right? It's part of getting out in the outdoors. And yeah. I, you know, guys are like, oh, you've got a 115 Swaro. Yeah, well, I still got to walk to the animal, asshole, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I pack her out of 115 squirrel. If we're going to ban those, so be it. I'm still going in the outdoors. I'm still going to find a way. Mm-hmm. But if you if if we ban sites and we all go to a recurve, I'll be very happy because, thank God, I got skilled with that thing. But you took uh, something that was um, m- mechanical, right, and you had to judge, use a range finder. It gives an animal a better chance to something that does it all for you. So not just, you know, the harvest ratio going up because I don't think it makes a shit of difference because probably if you have one of those bows on your sights on your bow, you, you might shit your pants and miss anyway, right? But it, it's a hard work thing for me. You're not putting the effort in to learn to judge or sight your bow in or yeah. all of the above. Makes perfect sense, man. I'm, I'm, I'm spot on there with you, I think. I think we both are. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. I have some buddies that have that sight, and uh, when they pull them out and I've shot with them, I'm kind of like – man but and, i mean whatever and that that's a that's a topic that i go back and forth on in my own head like what to me what is you know too easy or cheating i mean i i've slug gun hunted i've rifle hunted muzzle loader hunted uh compound bow recurve crossbow like yeah where where's the where do you draw the line at you know it's tough it is tough it's a good conversation it's a fun conversation well i think a good way to that i have found to combat that is and not combat that necessarily, but have maybe be a little bit more of a leg to stand on. I've shot stuff with a gun, a compound, and a recurve, right? Um, I, I've done it the hard way with the recurve. I've done it the easy way, in air quotations, with the gun. That if you are an advocate of the outdoors, hard work, learning your skill and your craft, whether that's rifle, compound, or, or, or stick bow, you are drawing a line in the sand, and sometimes when you that line is crossed, you make your stance. You don't cry, bitch, and piss and moan. I mean, I'll go head-to-head with anybody with that Garmin side on a high country mule deer hunt in cold weather because your batteries are probably going to fucking die, <laughs> and mine are not. Yeah. And, and, you know, I understand the concept, or, you know, you can still use it, but you get my idea. I know I'm going to outwork you because I had to sight my bow in. I know I'm going to be able to judge yardage when the time comes because I put the effort into it. Mm-hmm. So I don't worry about going head to head. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a harvest issue again, hard work. So when people are like, Oh, what, you know, what are you going to do if somebody takes Sitka or, or, you know, uh, your guys's camo away or what I'm going to do what I did when I wore cotton fucking pants, car hearts and a hoodie. I'm mm-hmm. going to get out there and get after it. For sure. That's what I did when I was a kid. Definitely, man. I love it. Amen. Aaron, I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, I thought it was super interesting. I don't know if everybody else will think that, but I I enjoyed the shit out of it. I think uh, it challenged my thinking a little bit on how I view things in the game, which I think is healthy to do as human beings, especially nowadays. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, so I, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to, to record this with us. Oh, yeah. I, I love what you guys do. And uh, yeah, obviously, you know, like I said, we promote you guys. I appreciate you having me on. And hopefully I didn't come off as too much of a, of a jackass um but yeah <laughs> I, uh, I i i 
if you take anything from this on my end, especially this last part, get in the outdoors for the right reasons. Learn. It cuts out right when you're making Have your exit. Fun, right? <laughs> don't do it for likes. Don't do it, you know. <laughs> I don't know. Can you hear me now? I got you back. You said uh, nothing. Yeah, I got. I got you. Yeah, <laughs> you cut out for a little bit, right? And you're making a real good point. It came back, so I think we're all right, though. <laughs> my my mic dropped early, but no, just get in the outdoors for the right reasons and and have fun and don't worry about um, you know social media. Just worry about you. Work your ass off, and I think you'll be better off. Yeah, that's great advice, man. And uh, shout out to you, Kafaru's killing it. Kafaru Cast, awesome podcast out there. So it's uh it's it's cool, man, to to know you and have you in for a conversation with a fellow podcaster. It's uh, I find that usually makes the most fun type interviews. So, um, so everybody check them out if you haven't. Um, Aaron, thank you so much. Austin, of course, thank you for always making it to the studio. Appreciate it, man. Aaron, great talking with you. Yeah, you as well. You guys I, again love what you're doing. And uh, we'll have to get you on our podcast here pretty soon. But again, great conversation. Thanks again. Yeah, man. Let me know when. We'll make it happen. Thanks, everyone, for listening. You know what to do. Go shoot your bow. We love you.